So thank you, everybody. I'm um, Andrea Barizani. You might have seen me yesterday in the NVIDIA talk. You might have not. So I'm going to talk here about the USB Armory, which is a project that we very recently announced and that is now in a crowdfunding phase. Um, I will be super quick about it because this is a one-hour presentation that we're going to squeeze in hopefully 25 minutes. So this is the device that I'm going to talk about, which is basically a computer squeezed in a very tiny USB stick, and it's all open source, and it's called the USB Armory. So why did we take on doing something like this? So we're a company that does security, so we wanted a very small trusted device for personal security applications. And as soon as we thought that it would be nice to have a computer in a very small form factor, a series of ideas popped up about having, you know, enhanced mass storage with advanced capabilities, using it as an open SSH proxy, as a VPN router, Tor router, electronic wallet, and so on. And all of these applications fit the use case for having uh, some hardware uh, like this. So the first uh, use case that we thought of was like, wouldn't it be nice to have enhanced mass storage so that not only I can copy a file on a USB drive, but it would also get automatically encrypted uh, with whatever key that you might want to, with a key that maybe it's selected upon the folder that we're placing the file on, or the name of the file, or whatever criteria that we might decide. So something that would have the flexibility to be uh, changed in the manner that you please. So not a single purpose fix hardware for doing uh, something like this. And if we have a computer on a USB drive, we could also maybe scan the file for uh, viruses, malware, whatever, whatever you like. So this is, was one of ideas. And, and the way that we wanted to implement it was to have a Linux, uh, tiny Linux computer emulating USB storage and then piping, filtering the files that you copy on it uh, to whatever filter that you might want to have. Um, and then, of course, once this idea came up, we thought, but we could do uh, so much more. Let's, you know, uh, if we have a, a small device, which is actually a computer, we could just use uh, TCP IP and then have capabilities such as uploading the files somewhere, sending it over email, wherever you want to, giving you a whatever, a Google Drive, but Google might be a very bad word here for this audience, so whatever file sharing or direct uh, upload mechanism that you want. So all of these possibilities enabled by the fact of having a simple computer open computer on a USB uh, drive. And then we thought, but we could do so much more. What if for deniability, you could have it wipe itself automatically if a fail-safe word is detected. You copy a file on it, which has a very specific name, or you create a folder which has a very specific name, or you do whatever action that you might want to do, and then the drive automatically wipes itself. All of these features are, of course, things that you cannot achieve nowadays with a normal USB drive or any uh, commercial product that is out there. So, and you can see the thought process. As soon as uh, we had this idea of having such a tiny form factor for an open source design, all of these possibilities uh, came to mind. Um, it, of course, can be used as an SSH proxy. So imagine that you are on an internet kiosk or using a computer that you don't trust and you want to SSH to your servers uh, from it. You connect this USB device onto your laptop. It gets exposed uh, with TCP IP. You SSH to it with maybe a one-time password uh, or whatever you might want or a password that you don't care if it gets compromised. And then from it, you SSH out to the internet by using the private keys which are stored on the device and that they do not leak on the uh, host computer which is uh, supporting the device for communication. Um, it can be used as a password manager. Why not? Uh, either something really stupid where you ask, you, you use a pin, you unlock whatever web application that you have on it, uh, you ask for a password for a specific site, the password gets copied to your clipboard, or uh, it gets displayed, or you, know, you can even have a proxy on the device itself, a web proxy that would just replace whatever uh, magic placeholder for a password that you're putting with the actual real password that, that never gets compromised uh, on the USB host. So all of these various applications 
are enabled by having such a very simple concept of having a computer on a USB drive. And of course, it can also do uh, the standard role of being used as an authentication token with UTF, U2F, the FIDO uh, protocol which was recently announced, uh, the Google authentication token, or any other token that you might think of, of course. And there's also a very interesting idea which now can be done with such hardware, which I really, really like, which is authenticating the host. So the USB device authenticates the, the machine that it is connected to. Because of course, being this now an active device with its own kernel, its own uh, applications that can be executed and scheduled uh, as you prefer, this device can communicate with your host and can decide to assess if the host that's being connected to is the legitimate one or not. A very simple mechanism would be just to check the uh, SSH fingerprint for the SSH daemon that is running on your laptop. And then, of course, you can decide what action to take if the host is not trusted. The device can decide to wipe itself. It can decide to even brick itself because the specific system on a chip has way to fuse keys uh, that if they're random, then the system on a chip would never be able to boot any other code. So all of these possibilities are unthinkable with, uh, with standard USB devices, and especially this one is something that, that I really like. You can even have it so that if this device is connected to a laptop which is not yours, it will not do anything uh, particularly damaging, but it will just present a different set of files. Why not? I'll plug it to your laptop, and you see Mickey Mouse. I'll plug it to mine, and I see porn. I don't know, you know, you can decide, you know, whatever you like. So, in order to support this application, we have a few design goals. It needs to be compact and USB powered. And when I mean USB powered, I don't mean to have a power supply with a USB form factor. I mean being powered by a standard USB port on your laptop or on your PC. It needs to have a fast CPU, not some very s uh, slow single purpose microcontroller, which of course might do some of these use cases, but it would be uh, highly optimized the code in order to achieve your goals. We wanted something which is fast and a generous amount of RAM. We want secure boot. We want to be able to sign with our own keys the code that runs on the, on the storage of this device and so that it gets executed on our, or my personal or your personal device standard connectivity over USB, and very important to have a familiar developing and execution environment. So not something which is heavily customized, not something which is hard to develop, something that it's easy, super easy. And of course, it needs to be open. Open software, open hardware. This is a security device, and one of our goals is also to minimize supply chain attacks. So you need to be able to look at this device to open schematics and see exactly what's here. And if you want to modify it, you want to have the PCB layout, we also provide that. So the challenges, the first of many challenges in doing something like this was, of course, selecting the system on a chip. And we went for the Freescale IMX53. Um, why did we choose the IMX53? It's powerful. It's an A8 ARM CPU. Uh, it can be clocked between 800 megahertz and 1.2 gigahertz. Almost every data sheet and manual is public. No NDA required especially for secure boot, which was very important for us. I wouldn't go as far as saying that the data sheets of Freescale are awesome, because they're not, but they're less crappy than many other vendors, which is fine by me. He has ARM Truston, secure boot, secure storage, and secure RAM on the system on a chip that we can leverage on. There's a detailed power consumption guide available, which to us is very useful when we want to prototype such design. And there's excellent native support. This system on a chip can run Android, Debian, Ubuntu, FreeBSD, the Gnode OS, a lot of different operating systems natively with no customization required, which of course saved us from a lot of effort in you know, customizing things, but also empowers you to just use stock Linux distributions on a USB device. Um, and also this specific system on a chip is a good stock and production support guarantee because you don't want to commit to a design and then find out in one month that, oh, sorry, we don't have this chip anymore because, of course, that's going to be a nightmare. Uh, I'll skip over this because we didn't have too much time. Uh, one of the things that we evaluate is having a good trust and support into this CPU, which 
uh, will allow us to separate the software that runs on this device to, to sh even have a further level of separation. So, of course, with this device, we shift the concept of live OS. This is not just a storage where you boot from. It's a completely independent computer that runs. But what we can do, we can segregate the code that runs on this device even more, uh, and having the so-called normal and secure world that Truston uh, supports. And these two worlds are completely um, separate. And the interesting thing about Truston is that not only you can separate something like the memory space and the code execution segments, but also all the different hardware subcomponents which are attached to the system on a chip can be assigned to one of these two worlds. So just to give you a, a, an example, there's an LED on this device, and this LED, if you want, can be assigned solely on the secure word, which means that whenever the LED is on, you know by design, by hardware enforcement, that at that specific time, the secure container is running and not the normal one, just by looking at an LED. And we thought um, that's a very cool feature. So in this way, one of the ideas that we have is to implement the encryption and decryption for the micro SD card in a secure container. So that even if the Linux OS, which is a, of course, wider attack surface, get compromised, you won't be able to extract the encryption keys uh, from memory because that memory cannot be accessed either by direct addressing or also by doing DMAs with the other components on the system on a chip because every single component is uh, trust on uh, aware. So this is a development timeline that we did. We had a concept idea in January based on a completely different system on a chips. In March, we began development. We did a breakout board. Uh, in August, we ordered an alpha board. The alpha board worked right away. We announced the project. Uh, in October, in November, we made an order for beta boards. The beta boards arrived, and from there, we finalized the design for the Mark I. Completely open source, open hardware. It is crowdfunding right now on crowd supply, and we're 72% of our goal, so I'm pretty sure that we can make this happen. But of course, if you're interested in this, please check that. So it is USB host power very small, he has a micro SD card slot, so all of the codes and the bootloader, they boot from the micro SD card. Um, there's a five pin breakout header for GPIOs, SPI, Asware C, and, and, and Serial, which you can use. There's the LED, uh, which can be used for secure mode detection. We tested already Ubuntu and Debian and Android and Genode OS running on it without any issues whatsoever. And we also tested that we can emulate Ethernet, mass storage, input devices, uh, pretty much everything. So, of course, so far I only mentioned device mode. And while developing the device, uh, we, I would say we were a little dumb because we drove the ID pin from the USB on the go to ground and we thought, you know, we can never change the role of that device. But it turns out that we can also put the device in host mode. So by putting the device in host mode, it means that if you have a female to female adapter, uh, which here it's implemented with a breadboard. You just plug a keyboard, a mouse, a USB screen, a USB Wi-Fi adapter, and you can use this in completely standalone mode, just by a software configuration. And then you can decide to pull it off, put it in device mode, and attach it to your laptop, which I think, you know, it's a very nice way of inverting its use. So for the super paranoid, in this way, it's completely uh, standalone. Uh, and this is the custom host adapter that we're making. Of course, all of you hardware nerds and geeks can make this very easily on a breadboard or whatever. It's super easy, but it's simply female to female and then a micro USB for power. So with just a uh, power USB hub and this adapter, you can use the device with whatever peripherals you want uh, in host mode. So what were the challenges in making this device? Of course, uh, we have BGA chips for the system on a chip and the memory. And it's also a very tiny form factor, which means that there was no way, at least we were incapable of doing, maybe some of you are much better than us, to, to prototype this by hand, to just order the PCBs and, and solder everything on our, on our own. So the process was, we make a design, we make the order for two, 10 devices, very expensive one, because it's a high specifications PCB, uh, and then we uh, hope for the best. And the other challenge, so and then the first thing that we wanted to do was like, let's try to be smart, let's try to avoid this, and let's do a BGA prototyping board. And our idea was, 
we make a really expensive board and we buy a really expensive socket adapter, which is there, which allows us to clamp the system on a chip without actually soldering anything at all. It's about a 700 euro uh, adapter. And maybe this way we can power it up and test pretty much everything except the memory and test all of the possible routing and, and configuration without you know, wasting a lot of money with PCBs. So, and this is the power boards that we tried to make. But Darth Vader there, which is me, killed the Admiral, which is my colleague, because it was something like, you failed me for the last time. Because after making 10 of these, we would never manage to make them work. Because the tolerances for distances between the inductors and capacitors and the, and the power control unit are so high that by doing this by hand, as, you know, as, much, as careful as you can be, you, out of seven voltage lines, one of them will not be stable enough. So this was definitely not the right way of doing things. So this thing turned out to be like the Super Star Destroyer, a giant thing which costs a lot of money, it's slow, and at the end of the day, it's useless. So don't do this. If you're making hardware, go for the you know, proper design right away. Because if you're lucky, like we were, it will work the first try, and you can save a lot of time. So when, when you have switching power like this, you know, don't, at least in our case, it was a completely pointless exercise to try and be smart. Second challenge, we use KiCad to do everything which is a nightmare. I mean, it's open source and we wanted to use it because then you can open up the design and modify it, but routing RAM with KiCad is, you know, I would really rather be in a different life. It took me two weeks to route the RAM between the SOC uh, and, and the memory module. So that was a real, real pain, but we made it, it works, so it can be done. And I think it's pretty amazing that you can do it completely with open source. Um, tools. Um, the reason why RAM routing is tricky is because all of those lines need to be exactly of the same length if you really want to be super, you know, paranoid about it. And when your PCB costs a lot and you don't want to, you know, waste money, you really want to make sure that they are the same length. And Kika doesn't help you in doing that at all. So then you go from the schematics, but KiCad is very good in giving you 3D representations, by the way, of the board, which is not that useful, but you know, at least it looks nice. <laughs> so we see our 3D thing, we get hyped, and then we make the order, and we get the alpha board. And the alpha board, you see the Admiral, it's a different one than the one before, because that one died, uh, but they all look the same anyway. So, that Admiral is alive and standing because the Alpha board worked at the first try. Again, I wouldn't really inspire you to make hardware, and even if it seems like a very daunting task for certain designs, this is one of the most difficult things I could think of making, uh, you know, chances are that you will be successful. So I really want to inspire you into doing hardware. So the Alpha board was a little larger because we wanted to have a JTAC connection and all possible test points to figure out what was wrong in case things went wrong. Because it could be really, really difficult to debug uh, issues, uh, especially when the board doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't power up. Um, and, you know, and also you have to work with the manufacturer a lot because doing a design on KiCad and, you know, even if your design rules pass, it doesn't really mean that you can manufacture that board reliably on a, on a larger scale. So it was really important to work with the manufacturer to understand what were the tolerances of the uh, pick and place machine, uh, the soldering mechanism, you know, to, to understand what were the various tolerances and see uh, if the board could have been produced. Also because when you make something of this size, you're going to violate pretty much every single recommendation that you find on pretty much every single uh, data sheet for every <laughs> Every single component. They will tell you, oh, you should do this. And then you're like, oh, you asked me to have like a soccer field, like miles of traces around the memory, but I can only go that way. So you will, you know, you will forget all of that and you will just go for it. But it works, you know. We had JTAG, which was useless, but it makes a very nice picture because that also works. And you can connect to it over serial port with a bus pirate. Power consumption was great, it works. We can turn on the LED, which we added later, uh, by the way. And the same power of a Pentium 2 is squeezed right there, which I think, and it's all done with open source tools. I think this is amazing, and anybody can do this. 
Thank you. Then we get the beta boards. So beta boards, we order six revisions uh, to, uh, actually one, two, three, seven revisions to lower down the price. So we try different things. We try to move from eight layers to six layers. We ignored a few recommendations about uh, how to power RAM up. Uh, we remove a certain components. We tried not to power the USB host, which at the end we didn't do, which is a good thing because now we also have host mode. So we went from alpha to beta, to uh, Mark I, which is uh, the final design. And the betas, as you can see, were uh, different iterations. So that was one order with multiple designs. They all worked, but from there, we picked one. We picked the one that was cheaper and that was most effective. Lessons learned, number one. There were some tiny inductors which were extremely fragile. And when I say fragile, I mean that after one week, they were just coming off. And not because the soldering wasn't done correctly, that you will never break unless you do it intentionally, but because the component itself wasn't meant even to be, to take the shock of being placed on a table like that twice a day for a week. They were coming off. The importance of testing, test, test, test. You don't want to make a thousand boards that have this problem. So one of the first things that we did we change the inductors with new ones, which have, which have a very nice shape, which looks like Battlestar Galactica notepad, so I'm really proud of them. <laughs> when you do hardware, you will get super hyped about these things. You're like, oh, I'm reading a data sheet about ESD. It's 50 pages long. It's awesome. Just for one tiny component. It's, don't do it. You get crazy. Second very evil problem. Gold plating. We need gold plating for the USB connection because otherwise, after 50 uses, it would just not work anymore. Um, the way you do gold plating, you do, uh, we don't do gold, pla gold plating. We just tell to the manufacturer, do gold plating on those pads and, and then we'll do it. And the way they do it, in this case, in the beta version, they, they need some contact points to place the deposit. And what they did, they did four traces that you can see there that were going outwards over the edge of the board. So what happened there? We plug the board, we see that we have a five seconds of delay, and then the boot starts every single time. And we're like, where are these five seconds coming from? So what, what, what are you gonna do? You search into every data sheet, and you search with your PDF reader, five seconds. And you find that five seconds is the wait time that the voltage regulator uses for under-voltage detection. And then we're like, so why do we have an under-voltage on connection? Because by cutting the board, we have four little conductive dots that may contact with the USB plug, then no contact, and then contact again. And that causes the under-voltage at connection. We didn't design those traces. The manufacturer did. And we spent three days banging our hands trying to debug this problem. So that was very evil. And on the right side, you see a better way of doing gold plating with the four little, you know, pads on the traces. So that was lesson learned number two. Even things that should be trivial, you know, options that you just click, oh yeah, sure, do gold plating, they might result in bugs. So this is... Uh, the final design, we moved JTAG on the back for people that still want to use it by uh, soldering those pads. JTAG can be disabled, of course, and when you are in secure trust zone mode, of course, you are not be able to use it, so don't worry about that. And we see the, the, the pin header on the left side, and I have exactly six minutes for question. If you're interested in this project, please go on the crowdfunding page. Thank you very much. And actually, I, I totally forgot. I have one attached to my laptop, and I can just SSH to it. So this year, this is my USB drive running Linux. And this year, this is the Electrum Bitcoin wallet running on the USB drive and being exported over X to my Windows machine. So all of the keys are on the drive. This application took 30 seconds to test. As soon as we put the device, we're like, let's do that. So you can see the potentiality of this platform. Thank you, questions? Question from microphone four, please. First of all, thanks for making such a great thing. And second of all, I'd like to ask if you have already um, an alpha or better software for authenticated boot. Uh, for authenticated boot? 
Yes. Okay. So the secure boot, um, there is an application node by Freescale, which we're going to convert into open source scripts where you can just use them. So secure boot is there. It's not something that we implement, but we're going to make it easier for you in order uh, to use it. So, and that should happen before, before March. Now we want to push the hardware out, but then we're going to make that. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Microphone number two, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, great project. And uh, there is uh, an SD card with Wi-Fi on it and uh, full uh, Linux system running it. And it's uh, kind of open source with unit booting. Did you take a look at this? And uh, what? Uh, What's the name of it? Um, it was Wi-Fi I or something from Sandus, if I remember correct. But there are two versions of it. And you can run your own code on it. You don't have the uh, nice debugging features, but uh, you can. Uh, uh, it's used for sharing f files over Wi-Fi for photographs, right? Uh, photographers, and uh, you can uh, manipulate the file stream as well. Uh, but it, it has less features, so this is great. But uh, did is you take a look at it before you uh, did this? So before we had the idea, of course, we looked at everything that was out there. And it was nothing that fit all the features and nothing that was open source like this. And also, you should be very careful because some of them, they will draw more than 500 milliamps in order to use the Wi-Fi and HDMI and the CPU. So one thing is having a power adapter, which is a micro USB form factor. One thing is being powered from the USB host completely. Okay, so that's a key difference. So none of these qualities were existing when we started this project, and I don't think they exist now uh, still. So this, in my opinion, is unique. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you. Microphone number five, please. Hey, um, do you have experienced any heat problems? And the second question is, um, could you imagine to put a, a robust casing around it so, such that it okay. so can working, be attached to a key ring and be carried right. around every day? So we're working on a case right now, and we hope for a case option to be available on crowd supply before the end of January. So we're definitely thinking of that. But it's, it's also open source, so if anybody has capabilities for making a case, you can do it. Regarding heat, we tested it, of course. If you're using CPU 100%, the memory 100%, it gets toasty, but it won't damage the board, and it won't damage you unless you're extremely stupid. So it gets hot as any naked board and any sock. But there's, there's not a problem at all about, about that. And we tested that. Microphone thank number you. one, please. Hi. Thank you for the great work. Uh, my question is about, um, you, you told us that this is all open source. And uh, now, as far as I know, the trust zone with ARM, you need to sign with them an NDA. No, that's uh, not correct. Every uh, reference guide and usage guide for Trustson is public and can be used uh, publicly. It actually, the support for Trustson, uh, is, there are two different aspects. There's what ARM gives you in the instruction set, which you will find in the ARM assembly instruction set, where, of course, no NDA is required. And then there's the hardware support, which is vendor dependent. The hardware support, which is vendor dependent, is only partially under NDA, but all of it is published within the Gnode OS source code. So all the information that you need to use Trustson is open. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone number three, please. Hi. Um, thanks for the great project. Quick question. Um, if you're going to use it as a standalone computer, it would be really useful to have HDMI at, at some point. I mean, obviously, it's open yes. hardware. But I wonder if you thought about it. So. One of the things that you want to be careful when you make hardware, you don't want to put too many features on it, because otherwise you're going to derail. We like minimal, beautiful designs. So we didn't think of HDMI for a second. Thank you. And guess what? We realized that by taking the inverse path, ha, 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 we can use USB host mode, and you can use a USB monitor. Of course, it's not like HDMI, but you can still, if you want to, use it completely standalone without all the hassle of having an HDMI connector. So I don't want to enter into the area of HDMI sticks that are for multimedia purposes. I want this to be focused on that. But who knows, maybe in the future. And it's open source, so if you want to add a connector, just take the project and do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. We can take one last question. Microphone two, please. Okay. 
Um, if I got that correctly, I can put my own keys on the device f uh, for verifying the software uh, that's running on it, right? Yeah. So um, how does that work exactly? How can I put my own keys? Uh, does it work via USB? What okay. does prevent a so malicious attacker? So you bootstrap, so you can do it from either the bootloader or from Linux itself. You can fuse the keys. There are certain registers which you can use, and you don't fuse the keys, you fuse the hash of the public key. You have four slots. Uh, and you can and you can also have one revocation key. I think I don't remember, but you can act, you can have up to four different keys, and those are yours. And once those are enforced, the bootloader needs to be signed with those keys. Okay. Okay. If you otherwise nothing will boot, and there's no way to override it. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thank okay. you, Andrea. Thank Please you very much, Andrea. A warm round of applause.